applaud it, how to ensure progressive values are reflected and enacted in New Hampshire. The theme of this year's event is fighting back, moving forward. You heard from Arnie Arneson this morning about how and why we need to do that. We hope that the conversations you've had in the workshops and in the hallways have inspired you and have added to those ideas. Many of you were in the room a couple of years ago, just actually a year and a half ago, when Grand State Progress and New Hampshire Citizens Alliance for Action hosted a smaller version of this event called the New Hampshire Roots Camp. From that event, we had ideas such as the State House Video Monitoring Project that came from conversations that people had in workshops, in hallways, at dinner tables, just like this. And we hope those are the same types of ideas that are generated today and that we can run and move on to strengthen progressive organizing and collaboration in New Hampshire over the next two years. So if you've heard a great idea today or you've contributed one yourself, make sure that you shared it and that we can find a way to transpire them into reality. Our closing speaker is someone who's very practiced at that, about taking ideas and turning them into something wonderful and real. Richard Parker is co-founder of Mother Jones and chair of the editorial board of The Nation. He's also responsible for growing environmental group Greenpeace from 2,000 to 600,000 supporters. He helped launch People for the American Way, and he's raised over $250 million for nonprofit work. Mr. Parker is currently lecturer in public policy and senior fellow of the Shorenstein Center on Press, Politics, and Public Policy at the Kennedy School, Harvard. He's a sought-after sought economic advisor and political consultant and an author of books such as The Myth of the Middle Class, An Early Study of Widening U.S. Income and Wealth Distribution, and Mixed Signals, The Future of Global Television, a critical assessment of the spread of satellite-based news and its political impacts. He also did a bio on John Kenneth Galbraith, which, if you look at the reviews, were, was met with critical acclaim. So I know it's going to be on my reading list as well. Uh, in his spare time, Mr. Parker, you know, advises the Greek Prime Minister, George Papandreou. <laughs> Just a side thing. Never one, apparently, to rest on his laurels, Mr. Parker's writings can regularly be found in such publications as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, New Republic, The Nation, where I hear he has an inside track, Harper's, Le Monde, Atlantic Monthly, and International Economy, among others. His public appearances can be found tonight right here at the New Hampshire Progressive Summit, and we are so glad and lucky to have him with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce Mr. Richard Parker. progressives. It took me a minute and I have to explain why. I uh, grew up in Southern California but from 1964 to 1968 was an undergraduate at Dartmouth College and New Hampshire almost killed me. <laughs> My first winter in New Hampshire, 1965, I remember quite distinctly heading off for a calculus class and the weather on the Hanover Green was 35 below zero. Now, for a Californian, below zero is what you are conditions that you create in the laboratory, not conditions that you live under. So I, I want to thank you not only for turning out as New Hampshire progressives, but also for making sure it's such a wonderful day that for a moment driving up past Concord, I thought I was back in California. So a perfect perfect state of confusion. You know, looking out uh, around the room, I realize that uh, this is a, a wonderful group to talk to because a lot of you, I suspect, have many of the same experiences and have gone through the same changes that I have over the years. In 1968, when I graduated from college, you have to remember what a year that was. Martin Luther King was murdered. Bobby Kennedy was murdered. The Tet Offensive marked the beginning of the end of the war in Vietnam. Charles de Gaulle had to literally flee France as the government of France almost fell. 
For a brief moment in Prague, it seemed that there was a new opening behind the Soviet, uh, 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 inside the Soviet bloc, only to watch it be, be crushed by Soviet tanks who killed the spring for another 20 years. And then, of course, there was the capstone of 1968, Richard Milhouse Nixon. It's hard to explain to young people just what it means to utter the words Richard Milhouse Nixon to our generation. But it's part of a larger narrative that I want to talk about tonight and help you to see why I think that we finally come to another one of those crucial turning points in American history, where to be alert and to be progressive means that our shoulder will push the country forward if we work together. Why do I say that? Underneath America today, the plate tectonics are shifting. This is the world's largest economy, and it has been since the 1880s. It won't be in 30 more years. In fact, the European community in total is a larger combined economy than ours, and the Chinese are no more than 15 to 25 years away from uh, passing us, leaving us not in position number two, but position number three. As we move from that unique hegemonic position of being the world's most powerful economic force, we're going to have to make changes. The ability of our, that our leaders had from 1945 onward to essentially dictate the terms of uh, our foreign policy and therefore the domestic policies of <coughs> dozens of countries around the world isn't going to continue. We can hope to be consulted. We can hope that values that are at the core of the American ideal can be shared by our government and by our people in this period ahead. But we can no longer look simply to material might as the way to move forward or to move the world in our direction. Second, we've built a military force that is ideally prepared for a war that will never be fought. The United States government since 1946 has spent in current dollar terms, according to the Brookings Institution, more than $28 trillion $28 trillion on American defense, more than $12 trillion of that on nuclear weapons alone. It's almost impossible to foresee unless the United States forces China into a posture that the Soviet Union once held toward us to imagine the logic of a military built around the centerpiece of nuclear strategic destruction. And yet, as you all know, right now, we have a military whose base costs are in excess of $500 billion a year, whose total operating costs, if you include Iran and Iraq, are over $700 billion. And if you honestly assess the total cost of the U.S. military, you don't just take the figures that are spent in, by the Department of Defense, you add the weapons research carried out by the Department of Energy, you add the pensions and the health care provided by Veterans Affairs. You include a portion of Homeland Security. And of course, you have to take a share of the interest that all of us pay every year on the accumulated debt of the United States government, because nearly half of that government's budget for the last 50 years has been spent on arms and destruction. And when you do that, we're spending today in excess of $1.2 trillion a year to prepare ourselves for a war that will not come. And I think that that's the second large plate tectonic that's starting to move. Because it becomes increasingly clear that when you as one nation are spending more on the military than all the other nations of the world combined, you need to rethink what you're doing. There's a third reason to think about why the plate tectonics of America are changing. 
It's in the demography of the United States itself. This is a country that was historically settled from the 17th century forward by European Caucasians. The country has been not only white, Caucasian, European in origin, but Christian and indeed Protestant for the entirety of its history. The very first census of the United States government taken in 1790 showed that there were, besides white Protestants and black slaves living as citizens of the United States, only 25,000 Catholics and 2,500 Jews. Ours is now a country today in which the majority is almost, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the majority will soon no longer be Caucasian nor Protestant. And minorities of color, minorities of, of religion, minorities of all, uh, all the manifold differences of the world will become the polyglot future of the United States. And that third transition, that third plate tectonic, is something that we need to pay careful attention to. Over the last 30 years, we've done, I think, on balance, an admirable job of using the politics of identity to break down the barriers of exclusion that kept so many Americans from fully being American. That work needs to continue. The politics of identity has been successful, but not completely so, and so we cannot stop working on those things. But as we move into a new century, we need to begin to craft a narrative of the United States that exists amicably in the world that lives on less destruction and finds among the variety of its own people a common narrative that lets us all consider ourselves American, not just a few. How we go about doing that is an issue that we haven't yet fully joined. We've been so preoccupied with the work that needed to get done that we haven't focused on the work that lies ahead. You know, if you think about the period since the Second World War, it's really clear that there have been two long arcs. I call them the Roosevelt Arc, and it runs roughly from 1945 and President Roosevelt's death up to our friend Richard Milhouse Nixon. And after that, the Reagan Arc starts, in some ways with Jimmy Carter even before Ronald Reagan. But I do think that we saw in George W. Bush the first signs of the ending of that second arc. What's to be made of the third arc is the job ahead of us. We have experience. We know what it means to be committed to values and issues politically. We have seen our candidates win and we've seen our candidates lose. In many cases, more of us have seen the latter than the former, <laughs> but it hasn't stopped us from being here tonight. And that's a very important thing to understand, that as these plate tectonics shift, an entire era is also coming to an end. Our frustration over the last three years, so many people who supported Barack Obama as a dream come true only to find that he may be just a dream, don't understand the process of change involved in one of those arc shifts. What happens is that those arcs represent, uh, the endings of those arcs in American history in both the 1970s and the aughts of this, uh, 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 the, the first decade of this uh, century, bear common characteristics. Wars that don't work, and are very costly, and financial crises that are made by us and mismanaged by us. J.P. Morgan's losing not two billion, but probably five billion when all the accounting is done in the last few weeks. Combined with what's going on in Greece today where there'll be a second election, and it's clear that the candidate emerging is ready for a showdown with Europe, 
means that I think that we all have to be prepared for economic storms ahead. We're not out of this mess. And I think that what we have to understand is that the only way that we're going to work our way out of this mess in a consistent way is to go back to the values of the Roosevelt arc and rediscover why it is that finance is too dangerous to be left unregulated. Anytime you look at American history and the number of bank failures, you see them go up and down and up and down and of course peaks in certain years, 1929 being the, the peak, all peaks in the 20th century. But then what happens from the mid-1930s to the mid-1970s? It isn't that there are fewer major bank failures. There are no major bank failures in a 40-year period of American life. We can't afford a financial system too big to fail because it's failing us again right now. And it will keep failing us in our retirement and in those funds that we've been, uh, tried to collect in IRAs and 401ks and 403bs. And it's going to fail our children because a house will no longer become a, a place of security as a place to live, but also as a small store of value, but a place to live that is of steadily diminishing value. And we're going to hobble our grandchildren with the mad indebtedness of higher education, leaving 21-year-olds and 22-year-olds, and I have them as students, facing the job world with no secure job prospects and in excess of $100,000 worth of debt sitting on their shoulders. That's wrong. To be progressive in America is to be American. There's always talk about American individualism, but America's willingness to pull together has always been what has kept us together as a people and what made the nation strong in the first place. We need to recapture a sense of who we are as a people in common and a people who cooperatively can rebuild this nation. This isn't the first time we've had a gilded age where the rich have taken advantage of the weakness of the state and the political confusion of the working classes and even the middle classes as well. This isn't the first time in American history where suddenly millions of immigrants are showing up. We're all children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren of earlier waves of immigrants. This isn't the first time that we've seen financial systems collapse. <clears throat> so this is not work that is unfamiliar to us. This is work that we should know how to do. And I want to submit to you that this year is probably more important than any in the last 50 that I could think of. For the young who had not been through enough presidential campaigns, and I should mention that the first presidential campaign that I worked in was John F. Kennedy's, where I manned the John F. Kennedy Lyndon Johnson office from 3 o'clock until 6 o'clock and passed out bumper stickers and walked around <laughs> slipping flyers under uh, the, 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 wind, uh, the windshield wipers of cars or walking the town with the door hangers. That was my introduction to politics. And I'm proud that I helped. I couldn't vote for him. I was 13. Oh. But I'm proud <laughs> that I helped to elect him. And whatever it is that we know about Jack Kennedy today, all of us, I still think, live with the memory of the way he inspired us to think about our nation. Barack Obama has that capacity and has shown that he too can do it. He hasn't shown the capacity to overwhelm, <clears throat> and I think only overwhelm is the way we can do it, overwhelm a Republican Party deeply committed to dragging us back, not to the 20th century, but to the 18th, 17th, or 16th. 
I cannot think of one large, useful idea proposed by the GOP in the last 20 years that I think would advance America's interests as a whole. I watched several, I couldn't watch all of them, maybe some of you have greater, uh, greater stomachs for it. I watched some of those GOP primary debates. I was sitting with a reporter friend during one foreign policy debate, I think it was in South Carolina. <coughs> And I turned to her and I said, I didn't think I'd ever say this, but I actually miss Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever one has to say about the foreign policy of Nixon and Kissinger, it was the varsity. These kids wouldn't make the freshman team. And yet they proposed themselves as the leader of a nation as large as ours in a moment where the utmost skill is going to be needed to manage our journey across these shifting plate tectonics. <clears throat> so when people like you come together, whether it's in New Hampshire or New Mexico, in Florida or Washington, it isn't about what immediately presses on us here in New Hampshire or here in Henniker. All of those things are reflections of the larger challenges that have become global over the years. There is no security for young workers in New Hampshire or anywhere else in the, in the United States without due attention to the world of labor. There is no possibility of talking about an America growing at 3 or 4 percent a year again without negotiating new relations with the rest of the world. There is no ability for the United States government and the state and local governments of our country to finance the desperately needed infrastructure to rehire the 150,000 teachers fired and hire 150,000 more and begin to celebrate teachers the way we have celebrated hedge fund operators, which to me is the chief sign of the illness of America. We have to begin to do that now. We can't afford to lose this election. I know Mitt Romney. And believe me, Mitt Romney is no Mitt Romney. <laughs> but we need to uh, re-elect the pre we need to do more than just re-elect the president and vice president. We have to turn the Congress. And if you had said to me six months ago, we could pick up seats, I would have said to you, <laughs> I stop smoking that stuff on a regular basis. <laughs> a, a long time ago. And I'm not answering the question about your regular basis. <laughs> but I think we can do it. But I think that we have to tell our fellow citizens a story about why this financial system keeps seizing up. Why it is that we can't get Americans back to work. Why it is that we don't see the bridges being rebuilt, the schools being reconstructed, the, 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 the medical system beginning to work even approximately rationally, rather than the irrational way in which it works today. I don't want to mutter on about single payer to a group like this, but dear God almighty, 17% of the GDP being spent on health and we don't even rank among the top 10 in most of the standard measures of either longevity for our seniors or infant mortality for our newborns. How can we screw this up so badly? How? So the importance of this election is to take the experience that we have learned in the elections that we have all been part of before. To understand that the election is not the be all and end all of living a political or moral life, those lives, our lives, go on. 
And there will always be issues that are not met in the way they need to by the party we hope to see in power. But you know, you know from the, the, from the way that the country's attitude on gay marriage is changing right now, you know from the experience of white racism over the last 50 years. I have to tell my children that when I was nine years old, my family stopped one summer in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I went around to use the bathroom and the water fountain and came back to the car to drag my mother around to explain why the colored water fountain didn't have colored water. <laughs> That's America within our lifetimes. And it's something we can laugh about, but we can only laugh about because the worst of that is in the past. And the only way that that was put into the past was because people like us would not stop. Would not stop. Martin Luther King was right. The arc of the universe bends toward justice, but it bends slowly, and we have to do much of the work of bending it. But when I look out on my students at Harvard and I look at the women alongside the men, the people of color alongside the whites, the incredible variety of experience and families and countries that they come from, this wasn't my experience at Dartmouth in the 1960s. I counted up and I went to college and graduate school and was taught entirely, entirely by white males. And for all intents and purposes, <clears throat> my classmates around me were just the same. So in just one 40-year period, look what's happened. No one, none of, none of my feminist sisters in the 1960s would have said, oh, well, we can make this much profit. Well, some of them did, but <laughs> nobody would have thought realistically that we could make the progress that we have. And all of us have complaints and frustrations about the progress we haven't made. But look at what has happened. Environmentalism, unknown as a concept in the 1950s. Who would have thought that we'd have an environmental protection agency? Environmentalism, historically in America, had just been conservation. Let's save Yellowstone, or let's save Yosemite, and let's save a few buffalo along the way, and maybe some grizzly bears, but let's go and pollute the hell out of every other river that flows across America. That was what we thought environmentalism was 50 years ago. Today, we understand what we're coming up on so quickly, which is, I should add, one of the other plate tectonics of America and the world. We can't keep consuming and polluting the way we have for the last century, or we will die. This is hard to say. It isn't even hard to conceive, but the politics is mean and vicious and difficult and hard to do, but we have to do it. You see, I think we all do come from some place in common. People in this room, as well as people in the Tea Party. We treasure community that balances freedom with justice. We also believe that equality is as important as justice and is itself a manifestation of justice. Not flat leveling that removes all distinction, uh, 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 signals known support for people who make additional effort or who have special gifts, but don't tell me that a 28-year-old sitting at a keyboard trading collateralized debt obligations is worth $2 million a year. She's not. We have let the salaries and the bonuses and the dividends of America distort this country beyond, this, uh, beyond the ability of our founders to recognize it. Jefferson couldn't have imagined this. He was in revolt against the cities and even the, the factory system itself before he died. Washington didn't foresee this. He lived off another form of exploitation, slavery, but understood that slavery would not last and, and freed his slaves at, uh, upon his death. 
They understood that their old world was changing and they had to give up. But they wanted a world that it was much different than the one that we've given to them. I think it's really important when people gather here in a place like Henniker to think not just about the issues ahead of us in the most immediate terms, the passions that we, care, uh, we carry most immediately, the work that we'll be doing Monday through Friday when we leave this place, but to think about why we do it, not just in Henniker, but in the United States and on the planet itself. I'm actually quite proud to be an American. I, I believe that this is a fantastic country as the first modern democracy as the first modern democracy I believe that we have set a standard that has helped lead the rest of the world away from the thousands of years of servitude and the <coughs> mad imagining that kings are somehow blessed by a deity to rule over the rest of us with absolute authority. To be a democratic citizen is to me the greatest gift this country has given me. And I not only want to pass it on to my sons and have them pass it on to their children, I want to see it expanded on a global basis. I want us, as we decline economically compared to emerging powers, to take the moral and intellectual strength of the United States that rests in values of democracy, freedom, and equality and bend the universe again toward them. We don't have a lot of elections where we get the chance to do that. I think this is one of them. I hope you'll keep working on all the variety of things that brought you here today. But I hope that you will take time to make sure in November that the voters are all turned out and understand what is at stake. We have a choice of going forward or backward in this election. But we will only truly go forward if we win not only the presidency, but make significant gains in both houses of Congress. And I think that we can do it. The electorate right now is uncertain. The balance of the electorate is uncertain. This is going to be a period of narrative contest, the likes of which you've never seen. And we will hear, we've heard it already, about how nasty and mean the campaign is getting and it will get worse. And this is where you and I become ineluctably important. Because undecided voters, we know from research, most often make their final decisions based on conversations with friends whom they trust. Not on the ads, not on the paid media, not on the screaming and the vitriol and everything else, but on the voices of men and women that they trust. I think you all have that voice. You have it individually and collectively. I wouldn't worry too much about whether you've mastered Twitter or not. I haven't gotten there myself. That's why I have a 17-year-old. <laughs> I think what you need to be doing, though, is engaging in as many heartfelt conversations between now and November with as many people as possible about what's at stake. If this, uh, if, if this Republican Party wins, they will balance this trillion dollar deficit on the backs of all of us. They will take it out of our Social Security, they will take it out of Medicare, they will take it out of uh, education, they will take it out of the environment, and they will keep spending a trillion dollars a year on this mad idea of defense that they find so central to being American. We're Americans. We represent the best of American values. We turned out on a day when we shouldn't have turned out to worry about the politics of New Hampshire 
and instead should have been toiling, as Voltaire said, in our own gardens. <laughs> but I'm glad you did come out, and I really, truly appreciate your willingness to listen to me this evening. I hope what I've had to say is at least partially persuasive. It's not like I'm talking to a group of 18 or 19 year olds. You know what's at stake. You know how tough the work is, but you're already here. My contribution was to drive from Boston today to talk with you, to share what I know about what's going on. And we have some tough races down there, as you know as well, too and to affirm my solidarity with each and every one of you. And personally, thank you for being progressives in New Hampshire. Thank you. in America is to be American and we pull together and I, I just know I'm going to use that line several times over the course of the next few months. Um, Mr. Parker has been so kind as to um, offer some additional time to take some questions from the audience. If anybody had a question or a comment they'd like to make, um, unfortunately we ended up being errant from our extra mic, so you're welcome to come up here or if you have a louder voice to speak from where you are. And I saw a hand up over here first. I'm very curious about what you meant when you said Mitt Romney isn't really Mitt. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen a baked Alaska? It's a whipped confection. Mitt Romney is a baked Alaska of a politician. <laughs> I, I mean quite sincerely, this man has more personalities than the universe has planets. He has been willing to adapt himself, stretch himself. He is he's the Mr. Flubber of, uh, 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 of the day. You could just, you know, it's, it's incredible. And the press both gets it and has ridiculed him for it and was certainly helped along the way by his opponents in the primaries. But you know as well as I do that now the game has changed. And it's Democrat versus Republican. And the press is going to make sure that this is a tough and close race. Right? And we have to keep reminding people that, believe me, Mr. Romney is no Mr. Romney. He's the man who isn't there there. <laughs> this, this, is, this is ambition with hair. Right? Ambition with good hair. I, we really do need you to write all those lines. <laughs> That's great. Do we have another right here? Um, I, I, I just retired from college teaching. And uh, as I spoke to the huge mass of 50 people or something that came out to hear, um, I sounded very pessimistic because of what I've noticed, and that is the sort of the end of empiricism, uh, how evidence isn't important anymore, uh, and that's what scares me most about the future. Everything you've said talks about the absolute need for people to begin focusing on real information and evidence. Am I right that it seems like evidence is dead? Facts don't make any difference anymore. And what happened to American empiricism? 90s, uh, truth to tell, those kids, you know, it's, it's funny. The way diversity has worked at elite colleges, we've opened up one end of the funnel, and we've narrowed the other end in terms of output. Over half of Harvard undergraduates in the 1990s were going into two fields, investment banking and, and business consulting. We fought so long to create diversity of opportunity, a diverse campus, and we get it in terms of input, and then we just squeeze them into iBankers and, and consultants. In the last several years, however, I've watched the kids change. 
I think two things have happened. One is I think Obama really struck a chord with young people and gave them hope of a kind that they'd never allowed themselves to feel in some way. Now it's damaged, no question about that right now. You know, like all of us when we were 17 and broke up with our first girlfriend or boyfriend, we're wounded and we just, but my message to the young is, there'll be more, there'll be others along, don't worry. Keep trying to love a leader who has values that you share. The other thing is, they're scared for the reasons I described. They're coming out of these schools with $100,000 of debt on their shoulders. They know that there are six college graduates looking for every job available in this economy. They see their friends working as baristas at Starbucks. And they ask themselves, what? what? What was this all for? Where are we going? Where am I going? What will I be? I don't want to just write the great American novel. I'd actually like to have a salary and a home and other things, too. So I think that there's been real damage done to empiricism. And nowhere has it been, uh, 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 empiricism been more damaged than in my profession of economics. We may have raise the level of the quantity of knowledge to unparalleled levels. But my profession is like a Jesuit, Jesuitic university in the 16th century, in which neoclassical economics is taught like a catechism, and there is no default, no dissent, no holding back. This is economics, and you will learn it. Human beings are rational maximizers of their self-interest. Supply and demand are balanced in all markets by price. And if left alone, markets will achieve equilibrium. Not one of those three claims is true, and you know it. And we have built an entire discipline on three core untruths. And we have used that discipline to hammer the other social sciences into a position of subservience, which is utterly incongruous because what psychology and sociology and history and government or political science have to offer is manifestly richer in total than my guys, the number crunchers. You know, John Maynard Keynes foresaw the day, he thought that, that, that within 100 years, he could see a much better world emerging. You want to know how he described it? One in which economists are like dentists. We need to treat economics and ec economists more like dentists and less like sacred priests. When we make the market God, we give up on all the values that make us human. The uh, criticizing the military seems to have replace criticizing Social Security as the third rail for American politics, especially on the national stage. Even Obama's had to be a hawk, has had to go after bin Laden, has had to support the surge. Uh, how, can you, how can you advocate a, a credible drawdown in military spending without being labeled on American? Uh, I think one part of it is that uh, military leadership itself recognizes that this can't go on. Uh, and uh, I've, uh, I've done a lot of it by simply quoting military leaders and retired military leaders. We're at one of those points that's like the Eisenhower 1961 speech, remember, about the military industrial complex? There are people like Andrew Basin, which you, if you haven't read, you should be reading. He's a classic example conservative Roman Catholic, West Point graduate, Vietnam veteran, decorated officer. Uh, le leaves the military, gets a PhD in Princeton, and is the and is the chairman of the International Relations Department at, at at BU, and whose son, last year, as a captain in Iraq, was killed serving in Iraq, and he is relentless on the distortion that these budgets and these missions have done, uh, uh, the damage they've done to the military. He's concerned about the men and women in the military as well as the budgetary effects 
on the United States. And I think we need to overwhelm these folks who say, whatever we can spend, we'll spend, by talking about the, hu the damage to our own military that these budgets and these missions are, are causing. I think that's the, that's the way in. I'm guardedly optimistic about our chances for winning back the House in 2012, but I'm deeply alarmed and depressed about the Senate. Because the tranche that's being standing for election is so democratic, and because many of those Democrats aren't really very democratic to begin with, I can't see how we won't emerge with a Senate that at best still can't uh, break any filibuster, and at worst is in Republican control. What do you think about that? I think, it's a, I, think it's a, I think it's a real challenge. I think you're naming, you know, it's, 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 it, it's the old uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, right? Um, I think, again, that this disquiet among voters is such that we cannot say for certain at all what's going to happen. And why, I'm, why I think it's so important that people like us gather and then commit ourselves to literally talking to almost anyone who will listen about the importance of this election and the direction that we need to go. I don't know what the outcome will be. Nobody's ever promised us an outcome that looked optimistic. As I say, I've lost more elections than I've, had, than I've, uh, than I've won. <laughs> But I've been deeply proud of a lot of those losers. <laughs> and I will sneak in one more because I see it again back here. When you were speaking about environmental issues, I was very hopeful that you might mention. Uh, that word that is the word that people seem to be afraid to utter, and that is climate change. Why do you? Why did you avoid it? And don't you think that when you talk about environmentalism and the long-range projections that come from climate change resulting from global warming, that that is in itself a fantastic uh, shifter of, of our tectonic plates? So I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't mention it directly. I did say very clearly, Richard, though, that we're running up against question? environmental limits. Yes, sir? Can you repeat the question? Oh, why didn't I mention climate change? Why didn't I put that on the table? Uh, you know, to talk to you guys about climate change is like talking to alcohol at an AA meeting. You know, <laughs> you know how powerful it is. I didn't. I, I mean, I should have said it. You're right. But I thought by saying that we're running up this against this environmental limit that is unbearable and that it's a combination of consumption and pollution, that that was pointing toward it. So that's. Okay. Thank you for clearing my mind. Um, from what you did say, I've got an incredible amount of notes, and I will be. The teacher your always letters. likes to hear that. <laughs> I figured I'd get some brownie the points for that. Be on a Tuesday. <laughs> I looked around. I thought, I wonder if he notices me taking notes. So he probably doesn't mind at all. Um, but thank you so much. I mean, you really have. This has been um, incredible to have your time. And, and seriously, the, the the way you talk about some of the most pressing issues facing our country, and particularly those of us who are very concerned at the state level about um, what we see happening in the destruction and how we move forward. Uh, I'm sure I will not be the only person quoting you <laughs> and passing it off as my own. We do appreciate your time. And please thank, um, join me in thanking uh, Richard Parker once again. She's been interning with Grant State Progress and New Hampshire Citizens Alliance for Action this semester to help put this event together. 
Um, she's been an incredible resource, an amazing organizer. Those of you who've worked uh, you know, with interns or newer organizers know you're never quite sure what kind of experience you're going to get when they show up. Um, Melissa has been incredible, incredible. Sarah and I actually fought over who would get her as a summer intern until Melissa <laughs> broke the news to us that neither of us would because she had a job. <laughs> but she's that great. Um, she's been a rock star and I'm sure um, we'll be wanting to work with her again. Keep your eyes out for her.